jump in this morning, and we are in the middle, or actually the end, of a series we're calling Something Good. Everybody shout out Something Good. And we're welcoming right now our online audience that are fixing to join us right now. What do you think about the online people that are watching with us today? Would y'all give them a hand clap? Come on. For all of, the, all of you who are watching, that are part of our church family, that are watching online, we miss you. We love you. I reached out to a lot of you this week, and uh, we love you and are so thankful that you're watching with us today. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and we're going to end this series, conclude this series called Something Good. Everybody shout out again, Something Good. good. Luke chapter 10, and we're going to look at verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. We're going to read all the way down to verse 37. This is Jesus and uh, give you a little bit of content here. This is a guy who comes to Jesus, and he was an expert in religious law. And let's pick up the story. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you have a highlighter or pen, please underline or highlight that verse if you haven't already. That's a powerful, powerful verse, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. Next verse, right, right, Jesus said, uh, told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. Nobody in today's times want to justify their actions, do they? So he asked Jesus, he asked Jesus, and, and he said, or, uh, so Jesus asked, who is my neighbor? So this is what he asked Jesus. Jesus replied with a story, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and he passed passed him by. The temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along and he saw this man and he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who attacked the bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same thing. We know this is the story of the good what? The good Samaritan. This is a very controversial story. Uh, It's not to us, but it was to the people of that culture. It was very controversial because Samaritans didn't associate with Jews. So there was a lot of racism going on, much like what we're seeing today. In fact, in some cases, I think it was probably worse. And so they saw racism just like we are seeing racism uh, today. And that's everything about this story and what this story depicts. So I want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer before I jump into today's message. And you know a message is good when the pastor gives a disclaimer. I don't want you today to, to mistake my intensity for meanness. Okay, I don't want you to think because I'm going to be very intense that I'm being mean. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to wake us up. Okay, and I also want you to know that our church is doing exceptionally well. Okay, we're doing very well. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely. Everybody has room for improvement, including me. Uh, so there, this is no way some axe to grind that I have, that I've come to the pulpit mad today, I'm not mad at all. 
And, and you can ask my wife, I am not one that is led by my emotions. So this is not emotional for me. I didn't come with any pre-faults or anybody in mind. So when I'm talking today and I'm addressing the church, I'm talking about the church as a whole, but that also includes us. Okay? And so today, the message series is something good, and about the ha- halfway point through this message, you're going to say, there's nothing good about this message. But what you're going to find is, is that I'm challenging you and trying to provoke you as a, as a mentor, as a, as a pastor, a spiritual father, also a coach. I'm trying to bring the best out of us. Because I, I, I don't think, I know we have to do better, and I'm going to tell you why here in just a moment. But we have to do better. So everybody going to be okay? Amen. Everybody with me? I love you. Okay. <laughs> It's like the, 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 you know, your dad or your mom, before they whooped you, they'd always say they loved you. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, right, you really love me. So, but I, I, I'm, I'm saying this because, and preaching on this because I believe we're in trouble a little bit. I mean, I, I really do, and that's lack of a better word. We've got Jesus, and we win, and we know all of that. We've read the back of the book. Billy Graham said, we all win. We know that. But we've got to wake up. And we've got to do better. And we've got to, to uh, really see what is happening and the importance of what's happening. Uh, I'm going to talk more about this in, 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 a, in a moment at the very conclusion. But guys, Jesus is coming really, really soon. And if you read the book, if you read the Bible, you know it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so we've, we've got to toughen up. And so that's what this message is all about. So... Um, in the Bible, this is referred to, the story we just read, it's referred to as the great commandment. So if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, Jesus asked two things out of us. One is called the great commission. Y'all know what, about the great commission. The other is called the great commandment, and that's what we just read just a moment ago. The great, the great commandment is mentioned twice in the Bible. One time in the book of Matthew, the other time here in Luke that we just read. But Jesus says two things. If you want to know as a Christ follower, we are, we are called to do two things. And what were they? To love God and to love people. That's the great commandment. Those are two non-negotiables for followers of Jesus. Those are non-negotiables. Love God, love people. That's the great commandment. That's it. That's it right there. That's it in a nutshell. That's what Jesus said. That's Christianity in its simplest form. You have to love God with all your soul, mind, and strength. And the second is you have to love your neighbor as you do yourself. And we can't miss this. Jesus goes on in the next chapter, in chapter 11, and he says, You're blessed. This is the next chapter. I think we have that. Um, Luke chapter 11. And he says, You're blessed when you hear the word of God and you put it into practice. Is that what it says? So God has an expectation. Listen to my wording, very important. God has an expectation of Christ's followers. We have to put these things into practice. Is that what that word says? So let me ask you a question today. How are you doing with these two commandments? Love God, all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. The second is love your neighbor as you love yourself. How are you doing with that? Seriously, how are you doing with that? How would you grade yourself on that? So one way to measure that, so here's how you do that. One way to measure this is by our reputation. What kind of reputation do we have? Now, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but just looking at 2020 so far, I don't see a lot of loving your neighbor as yourself. I don't. Now, I'm not talking to unbelievers. I'm talking to believers. I don't see a lot of loving your neighbor as yourself. Bernie Sanders said, and we all know he was a presidential candidate, he said Christians are unfit for political office because they're too hateful. Now, if that's true, that's, that's horribly sad. According to recent Pew studies, 13% of millennials view religion as important. Only 13%. 
And among those who describe themselves as Christians, only 18%, listen to this, only eight, this is believers, only 18% said their belief system was important to them. 18%. Y'all should say, hmm, or something. Like, that's terrible. Two thirds of millennials don't attend any kind of church service at all and see no point. Two thirds. At the same time, many, many millennials believe the highest... Listen to this. this. This just was horrible to me when I read this. Many millennials, that's hard to say, believe the highest goal of religious life, according to this same survey, the highest goal of being a believer is to be happy and feel good about themselves. When I read that, I thought, did they read the Bible? The thought process is that that thought process, let's say it like that, that that thought process is in total stark contrast to the words of Jesus. George Bernal Shaw said, No man believes the Bible means what it says. He only is convinced that it says what he means. He means. So most people like to take the Bible and give their own interpretation of what it says. And it's just rampant today. So if you quote a scripture, they're going to say, well, you use it out of context or this or that. And it's like this man in this story. They're justifying what they're doing. And they're twisting the words of the Bible, which... I realize some of these that you may have to study a little in depth or whatever, but a, most of the Bible says what it means. And it's, you don't need an interpretation of it. It's very plain and it's very clear. Come on, somebody. So we're in this phase in American history, and I'm not talking about the three phases of COVID. But we're in this phase in American history and Christianity where we've begun to look for this American Jesus that fits this idea that we should all be happy and that we should be comfortable all the time. That's the wrong goal. The real aim shouldn't be happy and comfortable. It should be that we're trying to find contentment this side of eternity. Now notice the word contentment, not comfortable, not happy, content. Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatever situation I'm in. So the the goal is not to be happy and to be comfortable. The goal is to be content. There's not a verse or story in the Bible that uses the word, it's all our words, it's all about us and we're supposed to be happy. So we have to get rid of this idea that the Bible says what I want it to say. And this idea of this American Jesus that fits me. We have to come back to what Jesus said. And Jesus said the purpose of your life is twofold. Love God and love people. Everybody say that. Love God and love people. And there's nothing else after that. That's it. But we're looking for this version of Christianity that fits into this American ideal and what we feel is the American dream. And we've lived that way for so many years now. We have a generation of people who are taking the label off. And so the older generation is looking at the younger generation and they're going, they're just a godless generation. Turned away from God. Don't go to church. But listen to me, what they're really saying is, I'm just going to live like everybody else. I'm just going to take the label Christian off and live like even the Christians are living. And what they're saying, what these millennials and these statistics that I just read, what they're really telling us as believers is, I don't see any difference in your life and my life. You look no different than I do. There's no distinction between a Christian and me. So why do I want to carry this label around? I'll just live like everybody else. And millennials are shouting in our faces and they're telling us, you're not living what you preach. You're not living this Bible. 
you got drama, you're mad all the time, you're hateful. I mean, statistics, and I'm not dogging on you, I'm in that group too. But marriages are failing, come on. And we wonder why we're seeing a decline in Christianity. It's because we're not practicing what we preach. We're not living it. What we're doing is trying to find this American Jesus that fits us. That fits our happiness. Come on, somebody. I know this is not popular, but it's good preaching. And that's what we're doing. Because we're trying to fit that into our little box. And we want Jesus to fit in our little world. But he's so much bigger than our world. Amen? And so this is what's happening. They're taking the label off. Ask yourself this question, how much do I love my neighbor as myself? Because that's the distinction. That's how they're going to know we're different than they are, is how well we love our neighbor. How much do I love, listen to the wording, how much do I love those people? We all have those people. You know those people that we're prejudiced against? You know those people? people? The people that make us, watch this word, make us feel uncomfortable. So fundamentally, I'm telling Christians this morning in this room and watching online, I'm I'm really fundamentally talking about things that all Christians know. This is not new. But the problem is we know it, but we don't do it. We know this. But I think the problem is, listen to this, I think the problem is we identify as Christians, but we don't live as Christians. We identify as Christians, but we don't live as Christians. The entire purpose of becoming a Christian is for Christ to actually work in our life. He gave us the two most important commandments, loving people being one of them. And this is not, listen, this is not some random book and some cool things written down. This book was written to change the way we do things. It's not some suggestion box. It's the Word of God. John chapter 3 verse 16, most famous verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He laid the formula for love in this verse. He showed us the formula for love because it says He gave. He sacrificed for other people. He's telling us and showing us what to do. Which means in my marriage, I may have to do some things I don't like, but I do it because I love her. And vice versa. It's about sacrifice. Everybody shout out sacrifice. Loving people is sacrificing what you want to do. That's what loving people is. It means I'm going to lay aside what I want to help someone else. You know, we love being the main character in the story, don't we? Everything is go, goes really good for us as long as we're the main character and all the supporting cast and characters play along. And as long as we're number one and we're in the middle and everybody's looking at us and everybody's tending to us and our needs, we're all good. As long as everybody else knows we're the main character. Come on, church. Awesome things are going to happen for me as long as I'm the main character. But I should be thinking, no, I'm not the main character. He's the main character. I'm a supporting cast member. And I'm supposed to be sacrificing for him and for other people because that's the two great commandments. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. Do we have that? Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. It says, you know, on days you feel like it, Mondays are are not the day, but on Tuesdays and maybe Saturdays or Fridays for sure, we're supposed to imitate God. Is that what it says? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Therefore, in everything you do, because you are His dear children, live a life filled with following the example of who? He loved us, and what did He do? As a what? 
Oh, man, I, I'm, by the way, I'm going to get me a TV up here one day, and I'm going to go to town when I do. But if I had that in front of me right now, and I had a pen, I would circle that word sacrifice. And it says we're supposed to imitate what he did. Sacrifice for us as a pleasing aroma to God. I wonder what God's smelling in 2020. I wonder what's going up into the throne room right now. A lot of stench. Be like setting a skunk on fire. Nasty. And I, I just wonder. And this, these verses right here, this is my thought. I'm going to use a current word. This doesn't really jive with American Christianity today. It doesn't jive with the American Christian. Because we believe God exists for me. And what I'm praying for, and God exists for my happiness. Let me ask you a question. How often do we pray for ourselves as opposed to other people? I'm just giving you gauges to see how you're doing. How much do you pray for other people as opposed to praying for yourself? Our natural default, mine too, so I'm not dogging on you, my natural default, your natural default, is that we will pray for other people when they ask us to, but typically it's God help me with this and God help me with that and I'm believing for this and I'm believing for that and there's nothing wrong with that, I'm not dogging on you. There's nothing wrong with praying that way, but it shows us the position of our heart toward other people and these great two commandments that he gave us. So hang on, God is asking me to sacrifice? He's asking me to live like Jesus for real? You mean if I believe in this thing called Jesus and Christianity and I'm a Christ follower, I actually have to do that? You really, listen, this is amazing because I've looked for it. You really can't find a scripture anywhere where God says it's fine to just do you. Just worry about your thing. There's really not one. But listen to me, we live as if there is. You can't argue and negotiate. Listen, I'm going to give you a word because it, it ties in these two great commandments. You can't argue and negotiate around generosity. But we try to. We all try to figure out how to feel better about not serving, how to feel better about not contributing, how to feel better about not giving. We're trying to figure out how to do that, but at the same time, the very thing we believe in is completely opposite and opposed to that thinking. Completely. Completely opposite. And don't take my word for it. Read this. Read what it says. It's complete opposite of that attitude. God so loved, He did what? He did what? He, he gave. God so loved that He sacrificed something that was dear to Him. Sacrifice begins with unselfishness, putting other people's needs above my own. Listen to this verse, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Instead, He gave us His divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when He appeared in human form. Watch this word. If I had my TV and my marker, I would circle the word slave. He left heaven and He came as a what? As a slave. It says Jesus came to this earth and he took the form of a slave and it tells us to take this same attitude that Jesus had. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. I believe there are people who are trying to have a relationship with God but can't figure out why in the world it isn't working for them and we're wondering why even though we believe in him we still feel like something is missing. Maybe it's missing because we have missed the entire point of what believing in Him is all about. Maybe that's why there's something always missing in your relationship with God because we've missed the entire point because we thought the point was to be happy. We're spending a lot of time thinking about 
all of that, which is the exact opposite of what Jesus taught. Two big steps. What are they? Love God. Love God, love people. Those are the two big steps. Believe in Him. Know He has created you with a purpose, or created you with purpose and meaning, and then He wants you to know that purpose and meaning is to be used in service of other people. So sometimes, if I'm not careful, I will think this whole Jesus thing is about me. And that's not the point. The point is to make these sacrifices that show people we care. And at the very least, the lowest level of this whole thing is about caring for other people. And putting their needs above my own. So James chapter 2. I want to look at this verse here. James chapter 2 verse 17. So you see faith. And by the way, faith is the whole premise of what we believe, correct? As Christians. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces what? It is dead, and what's that word? It is dead and useless. It says without faith, it is dead and useless. But here's what we do in the American church. Oh, I'll pray for you. Thoughts and prayers, hashtag sending them. Thoughts and prayers. Man, our world's going crazy. Thoughts and prayers. Bad stuff is happening. Thoughts and prayers. I'll, 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 for, I'll, I'll uh, do a Facebook post and send a word out that I'm praying for you. Bad stuff is happening, but luckily I have my thoughts and prayers. I'm sending them over to you right now. Can you feel them? But you see, according to this verse... Faith by itself is not enough. Belief in itself is not enough. Unless you actually take your two feet and you actually do something. It's useless. That's what it says. It's useless. It's dead and useless. Listen to James chapter 2 verse 26. Let's read what it says. Do we have that one, guys? Verse 26, just as the body is dead without breath. By the way, I didn't say this. This is the Bible. This is not Pastor Jason. This is the Bible. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without, without good works. Just as the body is dead without breath, faith is also dead without good works. I, can't, I can believe it all day long, but at the end of the day, my belief doesn't matter if I don't do anything. So I can't even call myself a Christian when I'm not really loving my neighbor as myself. So no wonder millennials are taking the label off saying, why do I want to call myself a Christian? If I'm bigoted, if I'm prejudiced, or I'm just being indifferent, I just don't care because it's not me, it's not my family, it's not me and my four no more. I don't really care what's happening. Guys, I hate to be hard today, but this is why the church is becoming ir irrelevant and, and ineffective. That's why millennials see no point in coming to church. Why? No different. There's nothing different about us. We have a whole bunch of believers. This is good. We have a whole bunch of believers, but not enough doers. We've got a lot of people that believe it. We've got a lot of people that will quote it. By the way, I've got a message I'm working on talking about revelation. And did you know God's not going to give you any more revelation until you actually use the revelation you've got? So, I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. It is vital. But don't just quote it. Do it. Do what it says. Well, how do I know what to do? You've got to read it. Amen? You've got to do what it says. We've got a whole bunch of believers, but not enough doers. So we wonder why this new generation of people are not feeling it, because it's useless to them. And what we've done is we just slide Christianity in with all the other belief systems in the world. Just another belief system. And the reason it's just another belief system to them is because they see no separation of what's supposed to make us different. 
Maybe I'll just be an agnostic and kind of be open to whatever it is God wants to do. And this is what they're doing today. I'll just kind of be neutral. And I'll just be neutral in all my belief system because I really don't know for sure because I really don't see nothing different. And I'll just throw this belief system in with all the other belief systems. And, and um, you know, our belief system is supposed to be effective, but we're not being effective. We're supposed to show up and stand out. We are the people that are not selfish. We are the people that give. We are the people that say, hey, no matter what you are, who you are, what you look like, what your skin color is, I love you and I'm here to serve you. What can I do for you today? Come on, church. But so many people are trying to find a version of this that doesn't ask anything out of me. I'll come to church, but don't ask me to do nothing. I'm sorry. I love you. Take it like a man. I'm just kidding. But we want a belief system that doesn't ask anything of us. You know, I really don't want a job that's too hard. I don't want a life that's too hard, so I really don't want a God that's too hard. I just want a version of Christianity that don't ask anything out of me. I really don't want to be a biblical Christian. And to be a biblical Christian, I've got to, number one, love God, and number two, love people. And I really don't love people. So number one, love God. Number two, what? And so here's what we do, and I'm going to bring this in for a landing. Here's what we do. We use three excuses. These are our famous three excuses. And after almost 20 years of pastoring, I've heard these excuses in every form and every fashion. <laughs> are you all ready for them? I'm going to simplify them, but y'all got some big verbal stuff you like to use to, to sophisticate these. But here's what we do. Me too. I'm with you. I do the same thing. But here's what we do. I've, I've done this. Here's the three excuses we use. Needy people are just too far away. Those people, you know, over in the Philippines, I would help them, but that's just so far away. Or those people in Pakistan, by the way, this week I spent a lot of time on the phone with a missionary in the Philippines and a missionary in Pakistan. Do y'all remember about three or four months ago I stood up here and said, we're going to do something for Pakistan? We're doing it. God has opened a door, and we're doing it. And I talked to, a, to a, a, a pastor there in Pakistan, and he was telling me all that is happening over there right now, and they're reaching Muslims. I'm talking about winning Muslims to the Jesus, turning that country upside down. They're seeing revival over there, which is a sign that Jesus is coming. Come on. And guess what? One community is a part of that. We're helping with that. That's happening. And so we say, well, those people are too far away. Here's the second excuse we use. There's so many of them. I mean, I couldn't help people. I mean, there's just the need is too great. That's like saying there's five kids in a swimming pool and all five are drowning and there's five of them, so I can't save them all, so I just won't save any of them. Well, I could at least jump in and save one of them. Here's the third excuse we use. Other people can do it. You know those rich people? You know those rich people, they can help them. I, I'm not rich. You know, I only make $30,000 a year or less, and God didn't really ask anything out of the people who make $30,000 or less or limited income. He made that very clear in the Bible. I haven't read that yet. <laughs> Guys, the commandment is to be generous. That, that's, the, that's the commandment. The commandment is still there. If we want to change the reputation of Christians, we actually have to live it. And the one word that summarizes to me the whole Bible is the word generosity. It, it just sums up the whole Bible. Be generous with your time. Be generous with your talent. Be generous with your treasure. And you can't negotiate your way around this. I can't try to figure out a version of this that exists without that. Because the very character and nature of God is to be generous. So that's the God I'm serving. So why do I want to argue with that? Because that's the character and nature of God. But I'm trying to find this version of God that exists for me. And God was a generous God. He gave His only Son. We just read it a moment ago. And guys, the church is where generosity happens. The government isn't going to fix it. 
I love our nation, but we can tell the government is limited and they don't know, they don't know if they're washing or hanging out. That's an old phrase. <laughs> They don't. They don't know what to do. But we're all looking at them going, help us, help us, help us. And they're, you know, they, they're limited. Guys, the government isn't going to fix them, fix this problem we have today. More Supreme Court justices are not going to fix this problem. Writing new laws isn't going to fix this problem. Come on, church. The church being the church is going to fix this problem. That's the only thing. Come on, give it up for Jesus. Come on. Not for me, for Him. This is about Him. Listen, we are the ones. We've got the answers. The church does. And people are wanting to see, is this real? Are you real? Are you the real deal? Do you know you cannot legislate morality? You can't legislate morality. Did you know laws can't change the hearts of people? Laws can't change. There's only one thing that can change the hearts of people, and we've got the message, and His name is Jesus. That's the only thing. So let me bring this to a close. Luke chapter 12, Jesus talks about putting God's kingdom first. And He says this verse that we would all like to take out of the Bible, but it's there. He says, where your treasure is, there will be your heart. The answer to the world's problem is us loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. And I want to say something, because here's, they're trying to group us with all these other groups and this nonprofit thing, and we're just another nonprofit and all that kind of stuff. But I want to say this we're not just some social change organization, we have the power of God behind us. So there, there's a way big difference between us and just organizations and nonprofits. Come on. We've got the power of God behind us as the church. And we have to believe in that enough to even, listen, I'm going to say this, and I mean this, we've got to believe it enough to even die for it if necessary. We do. And I, again, I'm not trying to be pessimistic or gloom and doom, but guys, read the Bible. And he said persecution was coming. And we're already seeing persecution. Christians are being persecuted in America. And we're, we, we've got to believe in this enough that we would even die for it. And I'm not talking about COVID or none of that kind of stuff. I mean, so let's pretend that didn't happen and we're just normal life. And we can't even be inconvenienced to come to church. We're, we're not tough enough. We're not serious enough. We're not dedicated enough. We, we've got to do better. Guys, this is, this is happening, and, and it's going to continue to happen. And it's going to, the Bible says it will separate the sheep from the goats. Who's real and who's not real? And we've got to get more serious that we would even die for our belief system if it was necessary. Are we there yet? You know, I don't like wearing a mask any more than anybody else. I hate it. I can't breathe. I don't like it would burn every one of them if I could. But we can't even be inconvenienced by that. But if that's what it takes for me to come to church, then that's what it takes. Because church is more important to me than my convenience or where I sit. Come on. If I've got to be inconvenienced, listen, because one day I may have to give my life for what I believe. Not just to come to church, but we've got to be the church. What, could a in, what kind of impact could we make? Right now, in our church, we have half of our people on a serve team. Half. And I could make a big deal about that and say, Woo, let's all clap and give God the glory. And why? Because that's a good thing. That's a good number compared to other churches that we've got half of people in our church on a serve team. That is awesome. But is it? Half? Is that really good? I mean, is that something to clap about and be brag about? What would happen if that was all of us? See, we all want to go change the world, but we can't even open a door for somebody. We can't serve in the kids' department. That's why we don't be inconvenienced. What would happen if all of us, if this whole church was on a serve team? Because we can't do more. He said, whatever you do with little... 
So I want to go change the world, but I can't even open a door for somebody. we got to start somewhere, and this is where we start. We're not going to go do big things in the community until we get the things in this community. Amen. And it starts right here, and we've got to do better than that. And, and, and listen, this is about changing the world and actually living what we preach. How many people could we influence? I'm going to say some hard stuff, and then I'm going to jet out the door. <laughs> but here we go. By the way, my email address is gone now. <laughs> but according to statistics, only 9% of Christians claim to tithe. 9%. 50 to 75% of Christians give absolutely, positively nothing. Don't participate. Don't contribute And by the way, this is a self-reported statistic. So in other words, they're bold enough to look at you and say, I don't do that. Economists say it would cost. Listen, this is so good. Listen to what I'm about to say. Economists, not Christians, economists say it would cost the church worldwide around $115 billion to relieve global hunger, starvation, and death from preventable diseases around the whole world fund the complete eradication of malaria, solve the world's water and sanitation issues, eliminate illiteracy worldwide, fully fund all current overseas missions work, and sponsor one million new full-time missionaries around the world where people desperately need the gospel. $115 billion. And we're all going, that's a lot of money until you find out what the American Christians make. Listen to what the American, not worldwide, American Christians have at their disposal an annual income of $5 trillion. A hundred, listen to this, $115 billion to do all the things I just mentioned, and that's only 2.3% of $5 trillion. What would it be if we gave 10% of $5 trillion? What would happen in the American, to the American Christian and to the American church if Christians gave a true 10%? What would happen? We all know the truth I'm preaching today. But what would actually happen if we actually lived it? What would happen if we actually did it? The solution, listen to me, the solution's already there. It's already there. The solution is there. So don't say there's not a solution. It's there. The problem is people walk into church and they have this attitude. All they want is my money. Of course we want your money. We want to fix the dadgum world. Microphone drop. Let me tell you something. I love you. Man, I love you. But Budweiser wants your money. Walmart wants your money. The beach wants your money. It's like walking into a restaurant and eating your tacos and your fajita shrimp and walking out and saying, I'm not going to pay for it. I couldn't find that in the New Testament. I don't believe in that. Listen, this is not a pretend game that we're trying to build monuments to ourselves. But all this stuff, but listen, all this stuff is not for us, it's for God. And and listen, that makes us feel uncomfortable. Makes us uncomfortable. That's why this room is getting quiet because we're uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm the most uncomfortable of all of you, I promise you. <laughs> Listen to me, the state of American Christianity. This is the state of America. This is so sad. This is so sad. But the state of American Christianity is this. We are so worried in our churches that somebody is going to write a bad Google review about us because we took up an offering. That is the state of the American church, that we're so worried about somebody writing a bad review. We are not tough enough. If we can't handle that little bit of persecution. And yet that's what we're worried about. 
this mission Jesus has us on. And listen to me, I'm closing. Pastor Daniel, come on up. I've got to close and run out of here as fast as I can. I'm just kidding. But listen to me. This is the mission Jesus has us on. And if you're an unbeliever, and if you're in this room, you're an unbeliever, you're not a Christian, or you're watching and you're not a Christian, none of this applies to you. None of it. But if you're a believer, this applies to you. You're a believer. And if you're a believer, this ought to make you feel very, very uncomfortable. It should. It should make us all feel uncomfortable. And listen, again, I want to say this. Don't mistake my intensity for meanness. That's not what this is. This is to say, come on, guys, can we be a little uncomfortable so somebody else can be a little more comfortable? Can we be just a little bit uncomfortable? Just a little, a little uncomfortable so somebody else can be more comfortable. So you say, Pastor, man, that was intense. Yeah, it's intense because you know why? God was very intense with me not too long ago. He woke me up. He got my attention. He shook me to my core. And he said, son, don't play church. Don't play church. Don't you dare play church. When I come back, when Jesus comes back, I don't want him to look at Jason because I'm going to give double the account of what I say. As your pastor, I'm going to stand before God. I'm going to give double the account. And I don't want to stand there and go, I was too timid to say the truth. I don't want to stand there and go, you know, I, we had some good church services. I want him to say, there's fruit there. There's fruit there. I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And guys, we're living in that day. I don't know when the Holy Spirit's going to let me do this, but the Lord gave me a word about a month ago for this time that we're living in. I hope I can share it, to, share it with you one day of where I believe we are. Now, no man knows the day or the hour Jesus is coming. We don't know that. But he said there would be indications of that day, signs. And I believe God gave me a word of where we are, and I'd love to share that with you here pretty soon. But guys, Jesus is coming, and we got to take this serious. We can't keep playing games. We got to get serious. I, I, you know, I used the words last week. I'll use them again. I don't think we've got years plural. I really don't. There was a time in my life, about a ten-year period, I guess, as a pastor, where I thought, I don't know if I'll see Jesus in my lifetime, as far as his return. And so I'm just going to kind of focus on death and that part and all that. I'm really not going to focus on the rapture because, you know, I just don't know if we'll see that in our lifetime. I've shifted, man. I think it's very possible I will see, we will see the return of Jesus in my lifetime. I really do. And when I preach this message and give you this word here in a few weeks, if the Lord allows me to do so, you're going to see, man, we're, we're getting close. We're getting very, very close to the coming of Jesus. I want to do this. I want to close like this. I first want to close and dismiss our online audience. If you're watching, thank you so much today. Can we just pray for all of those that may be watching online right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for all of those people who are watching online today, Father. We pray that you would bless them and you would use them, Lord, and you would minister to them, whatever their needs are, whatever they're going through, Father, that you would be with them right now. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for that, what you're doing online through this technology, through this platform. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Hey, if you're watching online in just a moment, I'm going to give our in-person people an opportunity to give. And you have that same opportunity to give. You can give online through communityeldo.com. That's the simplest way. Uh, that you can give. And we love you. God bless you. And thank you for watching today.